again to CEP for the opportunity to to give this presentation and to talk to you all, whether you're here listening live or or watching later on YouTube. Um, so, with when I started writing this book on the Azov movement, I mean, I I'd been preparing it for several years, but most of the uh, the drafting of the book was last year in 2021 from you know March April and finally fin finishing a manuscript in you know, September or October uh, even during all all of that time and all of all of the time that I've spent uh, over the past few years covering Ukraine not not just about the far right but covering Ukraine and then from about late 2018 early 2019 really focusing a lot on on the Azov movement. Uh, I can't say that I expected what I guess we could could politely call the current situation in Ukraine, or not even in Ukraine, but around Ukraine. It's it's not a situation that, to say the least, I expected to be uh, releasing this book in. I certainly didn't expect that uh, you know the days and weeks that this book came out there would be people having serious discussions about uh, whether Russia would, you know, launch some sort of full-scale invasion of Ukraine, whether, whether we, we, there was, I never expected that there would be a situation where there would be, you know, hundred some thousand troops mass, massing around Ukraine's borders and where it would turn into this, uh, you know, this, this international, Again, I'm situation. I'm using the term very loosely and deliberately, understating this, understating it by using that word. But uh, it makes it even more challenging, obviously, to to talk about the far right, to talk about the Azov movement, because I think, as anyone knows who is following the situation in Ukraine and around Ukraine, that everything is in flux. Everything is up in the air. Every, it seems like everything is an open question. So we're trying to, uh, you know, pin down a moving target here, talking about the Azov movement, particularly now as we get into 2022. And that certainly applies to the international context as well. So just giving a brief overview, uh, people who are watching, whether now or later, you don't need to worry. This is not some sort of PowerPoint slide where I've got 30 presentations and a bunch of graphs. If anybody's curious, there are eight slides, so don't uh, don't don't be worrying too much about uh, about me trying to bore you to death via PowerPoint. Uh, so, just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to give a bit of very basic bit of background about what the Azov movement is, uh, where it came from, what it's done, what it's what it's become. Um, and then, then I'll move on to the core part of what I want to talk about is uh, what I call international ambitions. Now, I've chosen that title for this, this little section of the presentation because that is actually the title to one of the chapters of my book, um, chapter six. Unfortunately, I know exactly all the chapter titles and numbers in my head already by this point. But as, as you might expect, that's the chapter where I talk about um, Azov's international presence. And so we'll be talking about that and then moving into the, again, like I mentioned, the current uh, situation in and around Ukraine and what it might mean or what it might not mean for the Azov movement, for the far right and for international connections or relationships as well. So I'll move first to give a few, uh, you know, basics of, of the Azov movement. Uh, just minimizing this so I can see everything here. Um, so some of this, I think a lot of listeners are going to already be familiar with, but uh, for those who are not, or those who, who feel they might need a bit of a refresher, uh, the Azov movement has its roots in, its direct roots in uh, 2014 when war with uh, Russian-backed or Russian proxy forces uh, um, began in uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, after the revolution on Maidan in 2013, early 2014, uh, Ukraine's military, Ukraine's armed forces were in complete tatters. It was 
plagued by corruption, underfunded, under-equipped, and not in any position really to fight any sort of war or of whatever scale against uh, any serious military power, let alone Russia, and let alone any you know, smaller, quote unquote, separatist forces backed or funded by Russia. So with this sort of, uh, this, this situation where somebody needed to step in to defend the country, to defend Ukraine against the incursion that was, that had really started in April, 2014 in Donbass in, in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, a lot of volunteers in Ukraine May, took it upon themselves to, well, volunteer, took up arms to fight in uh, relatively hastily formed battalions or military units uh, under under the the uh, the approval of you know, rel- of the government state forces in Ukraine. And to be clear, not all of these, by any means, were far right or were filled or filled with extremists or in, in any sense of the word. But some of the individuals and groups that uh, took up arms to, to to step in and try to defend Ukraine were members of Ukraine's far right. And as the war started to really kick off in you know, April, May 2014, uh, some of these far right forces formed from you know, a, a neo-Nazi group originally from uh, Kharkiv called Patriot of Ukraine, as well as other sort of uh, football hooligans and other elements of far-right subcultures that had been around in Ukraine and were also actually active on the revolution on Maidan. Uh, they took up arms with the sort of under the sanction of Ukraine's interior ministry and became what the uh, be, what became known pretty quickly as the Azov Battalion. It was named for where it uh, started to train and where it really had its birth along the Sea of Azov in southeastern Ukraine. And by, 20, by within a, a few months of war, including taking losses and fighting, fighting in various battles and, uh, and whatnot, the, uh, the battalion was upgraded to a regiment in Ukraine's National Guard. The battalion from the first place was uh, a part of Ukraine's newly reformed National Guard uh, structure. And so from there, the regiments continued to fight. But as things went into late 2014, early 2015, after the second Minsk uh, agreement of a of, of early 2015, of February 2015, uh, what was the Azov Regiment, or what, what is the Azov Regiment, began to expand into, in, into a broader social movement. It became, r- rather than just a military unit affiliated with the country's National Guard, it, be, it the, uh, the first sort of a, element of this was something called the Azov Civil Corps. So that was kind of the first extension of, of the, the regiment, the, the armed military unit into the, I guess, non-military parts of society. And into 2016, that expanded into other projects. Civil Corps essentially became the National Corps political party. Then other projects or other offshoots or, I guess, affiliated or sometimes even unaf- officially unaffiliated groups like the... Uh, the best best translation is national militia, which ended up becoming the Centuria. I guess we could call it paramilitary or organization, and all sorts of other smaller scale and and larger scale projects, all of, affiliated with what became known as and what's become known as the Azov movement, and that that that's resulted in a situation where there are youth corps, politi- um, youth camps, book clubs. Um, sport, sports core sorts of things, and then all sorts of other initiatives like that. But w- one thing that's key to understand about where Azov came from and where it uh, has continued and how, uh, how it's continuously evolved is that it's benefited from patronage relationships and there's alleged patronage relationships with uh, different powerful officials or uh, powerful political figures in Ukraine uh, 
uh, it's it's relied on those relationships to so, sort of from the get go put its foot in the door uh, in in early 2014 when the then battalion was being formed it was formed as a result of the sort of intercession or the involvement of the country's then interior minister Arsen Avakov who had pat, uh, patronized as those predecessors patriot of Ukraine in a, in Kharkiv it was it was a group of, of individuals on the far right who he had had relationships with and he, that he knew so the w without that sort of help or hand up from a very powerful interior ministry I'm not sure the battalion and the broader movement itself would have gone anywhere but beyond that uh, the Azov movement and the far right in general in Ukraine has been able to achieve some degree of interpenetration with uh, law enforcement bodies of course that's something that I think is fair to say happens in other countries across Central and Eastern Europe. Serbia is an example of where this sort of thing happens as well, just so we're not singling out Ukraine as some sort of unique phenomenon in, the, in, in, their, in this respect. But there's also been alleged, and I'm very much stressing the term alleged here because some of these things aren't proven that, uh, well, some of them are proven that, uh, or have been discussed before that uh, different uh, oligarchs in Ukraine have had some sort of financial relationship or have in some ways helped the as of regiment or the broader movement in some ways again some of these are you know where i where are individuals like uh, igor kolomoisky who had provided some help to the battalion then regiment in 2014 but then there's also allegations and constant uh, discussion about individuals like uh uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, the, uh, so, uh, I guess, politely call him a pro-Kremlin uh, um, figure in Ukraine, ironically, who has been alleged to have had some relationship with the Azov movement in the past, and also oligarch uh, Rina uh, Akhmetov, who, again, allegedly has had some role in with 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 the Azov movement in the past and present. But again, those are those last two specific claims are very much, I'm very much bracketing in the term alleged. They would certainly, I think, deny that the, those connections are there. But these, those are the sorts of uh, allegations or discussions that you do see percolate around Ukrainian media sources and generally just this sort of gossipy political sphere in Ukraine. And along with that, there are, the, the Azov movement has a long laundry list of alleged links to crime and, and criminal elements. This is something I discuss extensively in the book. What's ironic is that a lot of what these uh, allegations and uh, different different arrests or different different instances of, of alleged criminal links aren't a secret. They're, they're not hard to find in different Ukrainian media sources, different, you know, different, sort of buried on different web pages, different news sources. And some of them are substantiated, some of them are not. But as I discussed in an entire chapter of, of my book, uh, there is a very much a dark cloud of alleged criminality that hangs over the Azov movement and indeed much of the far right in Ukraine period. And it's something that uh, I'll be the first to admit is not explored enough, whether in Ukraine or in, in any other country. Um, just moving on from that point, something else that's really key to stress about, based so to try to give sort of a basic fundamental understanding of of the Azov movement is how adaptable and how fast changing it can be. There can be subgroups or affiliated groups or groups that are unofficial, unofficially affiliated, but uh, are, are led by or, or have some involvement from Azov movement figures. It's really fascinating to, to watch over a period of a few months even how a subgroup or an individual can all of a sudden seem to emerge out of nowhere with some some new group that gets patronized and gets a lot of headlines and then seems to suddenly disappear or in some cases just rebrand with a similar logo or a different logo under a different name and really to stress how fast changing 
the Oslo movement can be from the time that uh, I completed the manuscript of my book, which was, you know, last fall. So in the last four to five months, there are, they're very small instances, but there are instances where I've identified a group that has already since rebranded or changed, changed what it does. It's very, it, sometimes it's very hard to pin down who, what, what groups are involved with the movement, what, who, who, who is, who isn't, uh, are they prominent, are they not, are they going to disappear tomorrow, is somebody, are they going to change direction, so it's, it's something to always keep in mind when trying to pin down, especially as an outsider, what the ASA movement is and isn't, is that things are are always constantly in flux. And my last sort of tongue in cheek point there, um, too often, I think particularly in, in English language coverage uh, and other, other sorts of English language accounts or discussion of the Azov movement, there is still this tendency to just refer to everything, the regiment, the movement as the quote unquote, as of battalion. Now, I think if if one were to look at maybe some of the articles I wrote in late 2018, early 2019, maybe I myself use the term as of battalion in there. Somebody can find it and show it to me. That's 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 fine. But it's it's 2022, guys. The as of movement has been received a considerable amount of international media coverage, which we'll cover in a few slides, a few slides from now. And if it's if we're in early 2022 and we're still referring to this movement as the Azov Battalion, it betrays a lack of understanding or insight into what this movement is and isn't. So please, I, I, I beg of you, please stop calling it the Battalion. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm just going to move along here. Why aren't you moving? Okay. Hmm. If it doesn't move, maybe end presenting and start afresh. Yeah. Because that worked before, so. Okay, well, sorry about this, guys. That, All right. Uh, share screen. Desktop. Share. Participants can now see my screen. Yes, we can. Ah, there we go. Ah, there you go. Perfect. Beautiful. All right. Sorry, guys. Um, so moving on then to international ambitions, again, what I've titled one of the chapters of, of, of my book, in, in which as is, should be fairly obvious, the chapter about Azov's international presence. And I think it's, it's clear to stress, and I think maybe a bit of time has passed, you know, eight years since the beginning of, of, of war in Ukraine. But it's key to remember that there has been an international presence from the start with the Azov movement, particularly the then Azov battalion into the regiment. There's no shortage of media articles from all sorts of Western and Ukrainian and all over the world media outlets talking about the far right foreign fighters who took up arms for the Azov battalion from you know, different far right extremist or outright neo Nazi backgrounds. Uh, you know, fighters from Sweden, for example. Uh, some prominent ones, Croatia as well, there were a few. But uh, what's interesting to stress, and people sometimes are not always aware of this, but most foreign fighters who came to the Azov Battalion, then regiment in 2014, were from Russia. They were Russian far-right figures, neo-Nazis, who were opposed to Putin. They had been... I, this isn't the time to discuss in detail, but I do discuss, discuss it in the book briefly about how um, Putin essentially, this is a very quick and dirty explanation, essentially froze out most of uh, the Russian far right uh, after a period of kind of at some point even collaborating or working with the far right, essentially saw them as a, a force that he couldn't control or a force that, he, that uh, he, he should he should have nothing to do with or be opposed to. So Russian far right figures started even before Maidan started finding themselves in, in trouble from Russian law enforcement. So when this this opportunity of frankly this opportunity of war came up to fight with a far right uh, military unit, a lot of Russian far right figures just 
hopped over to Ukraine and uh, took up arms with the Azov Battalion, then regiment. And many, many of those Russians are still in Ukraine today. They're not fighting anymore, but they're clearly still involved with the broader Azov movement. So from 2014 and 15, from the heights of war, the talk of different international foreign fighters, a lot of what where things moved from there was more into networking with the, the broader European far right. So you saw efforts from particularly 2016 in through 2018 and into 2019 efforts from the uh, National Corps, National Corps, the Azov Movement's political party. Uh, you saw movements from the National Corps, then International Secretary, to do a lot of networking with different uh, in European uh, far right groups and even beyond. I've mentioned some examples there, just in the in the line there. Connections with German far right uh, groups, uh, the Third Way. Nobody needs to hear me pronounce tr try to speak German, so I'm just going to call the group the Third Way. If you know who I'm talking about, then you can probably pronounce it in German better than I can. But there were also connections with fringe far, fr, fr, this is a lot of FR sounds in our fringe, French far right groups that incidentally, inc incidentally no longer exist, but also connections with Pol Polish groups and groups even in Italy, like the Casa Pound uh, Italian movement and, and other countries there that I haven't mentioned, like uh, Croatia, um, for, for example, and then other other movements in the uh, in Scandinavian countries, for example. So this sort of networking was going on very openly for several years. It was not a secret. It was all being broadcast in in, in English for the most part. It didn't take a lot of effort, frankly, to follow the then international secretary and other people's pages and when when they had Facebook pages to see who they were meeting with, what they were up to, what they were saying, what kinds of groups they were working with. It was all public, it was all open. It was all open to the point where as we got into 2019, I would sometimes quite literally see things that were posted about some of these international networking uh, occasions from the Azov movement and almost you know, put, put my head in my hands thinking, why are you, why are you posting this? You're making this so, so obvious and so apparent and we can all see who you're networking with and what you're doing but they didn't seem to think much of it didn't really seem to care but then 2019 as a, this i expand on this in the book 2019 essentially changed everything for azov's international ambitions the first thing that happened uh, as the bullet point there makes clear was something that was out of their control was the Christchurch terror attack in New Zealand. Um, the result of that attack, as well as several other far right terror attacks and in, in other countries, including Germany and the United States, that really increased the attention of international governments, international policymakers on far right extremism and and far right terrorism. So from that alone, uh, the Azov movement started with the fact that so much of what it was trying to do was so open in terms of networking with international far right figures, including figures who had his, histories or backgrounds in violence and who sometimes, you know, were a little more cavalier with their uh, their support or justifications of terrorism. So maybe not exactly the kinds of uh, well mannered people they should have been having something to do with. But what happened also with the, the, um, the Christchurch attack is that the shooter, um, I, I, don't, I don't mention his name, it's just I don't like to, uh, he it, it, what first started getting uh, apparent connections to the Azov movement talked about was the fact that on his backpack and also a few other, and also on the, uh, the front cover of his infamous manifesto, there was a, a black sun symbol, which is a, a neo-Nazi symbol, despite what as of people try to say. But it's a symbol that is also used, an identical symbol used by the Azov movement, but also, of course, other neo-Nazis, other far-right people around the world. So that 
started to get some people wondering, I think, about the possible connections of the shooting to Ukraine. It was also, there was also a mention of Ukraine very briefly in the shooter's manifesto. He referred to Ukraine, just literally in one word, Ukraine, as, as part of a list of countries he seemed to be familiar with. And, uh, you know, seemed to basically, I don't remember the exact text of the manifesto in this in this part, but basically saying he had been to Ukraine at some point. So from, from there, a lot of people in 2019 really kind of went a bit overboard in terms of trying to link the uh, Christchurch terrorists to the Azov movement. And that really culminated in the autumn of 2019, I think it was November 29, October, November 2019, when there was a, a letter from, I think it was signed by maybe around 40 U.S. Congress uh, members of Congress that uh, was sent to the State Department asking that several far-right movements, including the quote-unquote Azov Battalion, be sanctioned as foreign terror organizations in the United States. And what I found particularly galling about that letter is that it it claimed, the letter claimed that the Christchurch shooter said in the manifesto that he had trained with Azov in Ukraine. And that's, that's absolutely not in the manifesto. And further, there, even now, there's still no evidence that the Christchurch shooter had anything to do with Ukraine. Uh, what well, his connections, and very loosely connections to Ukraine, as were eventually revealed in a uh, I think a, a New Zealand Royal Commission report about the uh, about the attack uh, that um, the the shooter had been to a number of countries across Central and Eastern Europe. Ukraine was one of them for a few weeks, maybe about four weeks in 2015. But he, ironically, he went to Russia immediately after that for an even longer period of time. He spent extended periods of time in countries in the Balkans, like. Bulgaria and Serbia and, and places like that. So the linking, uh, facetiously or not, accurately or not, the linking of the Christchurch shooter in the, uh, much English language coverage, particularly American coverage of the Azov movement really uh, stained whatever limited international reputation they had at that point. So the co combined with the general increased uh, media scrutiny from them thanks to th thanks to being so public about their their international networking um the fact that christchurch happened and in some ways was unfairly and inaccurately linked to them it really put a damper on doing anything in the international arena so that's why by 2020 um these again i, I stress these open or public international connections had really, really reduced in scope. By even before the pandemic hit in, you know, in March 2020, even I noticed at the time that the Azov movement had really scaled back its its international activities, its international presence to the point where they seemed to be barely doing anything. And then, of course, the pandemic started unfortunately and obviously as we all know it hasn't left us yet but uh, i think especially in 2020 the pandemic played a role in uh, some of these international connections being peeled back because well obviously they're for for anyone there are far fewer opportunities to meet up to network anything like that uh, but moreover the i think the the considerable international negative media scrutiny and the scrutiny of uh, policymakers from Western countries uh, really led to a, a reaction within within the movement to just not be interested anymore, or at least for the time being, in finding, or at least publicly, finding foreign friends or recruits, especially from the United States. Uh, I think you really saw this in, I believe it was 2020, uh, where several Americans who said they were affiliated with the uh, neo-Nazi Adam Waffen division uh, showed up in Ukraine and uh, talked about and wanted to join the Azov regiment. And I believe in December 2020, they were just kicked out of the country. And of course, they got nowhere near uh, joining, joining the regiment, which is not an easy thing 
to do for a foreigner period. If not, I think it's basically at this point, it's impossible for a foreigner or a, for, a foreigner to join the regiment uh, in in uh, the regiment's own recruitment, uh, like its own recruitment channel on Telegram, for example. They explicitly state one has to be a Ukrainian citizen. So I think we're at a point now, even before the, the current situation, so looking back to last year, the idea of some Western foreign wannabe foreign fighter from the far right, some far right extremist thinking that they could show up to Ukraine and uh, start, uh, you know, just meet like, as if it were like 2014. The idea that they could show up in Kiev and uh, meet, meet up with somebody from Azov and a few days later be training with similar uh, like minded far right extremists and be fighting at the front lines of a hot war. That is not the reality now, and it has not been the reality for a long time. I think even as the situation remains unpredictable in and around Ukraine, there's little appetite for anybody who entertains even the slightest far right sympathies to to be welcomed with open arms into any military unit in Ukraine, let alone the regiment. And so that's led to a situation where by now, by 2022, um, the international networking of the Azov movement is really limited. Where, whereas when I first really started following the movement closely in 2018, 2019, you saw the then international secretary try to meet up with all sorts of far right individuals and groups under the sun. Whereas now, especially through the Azov Movement's Intermarian Project, a lot of the international outreach or the international partners or networking is limited essentially to countries like smaller countries where they have some personal relationship with somebody. And they use the, the three examples of Estonia, Poland, and uh, Croatia as the countries where really the only three countries where they they seem to have any um, public or obvious international networking presence. There, there are some connections, erstwhile connections from some, from some smaller linked Azov groups you saw from this group called Tradition and Order, which is actually one of the groups I mentioned earlier, who have since uh, rebranded and changed their name and perhaps in some ways changed their focus. They had had connections with, uh, uh, with, with an apparent cell, quote unquote, in, uh, in Germany and had some connections in Germany. And I know of another friend, uh, uh, far right group, uh, you know, sort of unof unofficially affiliated with, with the Azov movement who has been uh, networking with the group in the Western Balkans. And so some of these connections do exist and to stress there are, there could very well be some small scale private connections that for obvious reasons are not being made public, but um, there, the international profile or presence that we saw with the Azov movement in, especially in early 2019, three years later is just a shadow, a tiny shadow of what it used to be. But of course, now we have what can only politely refer to as the current situation in and around Ukraine and on, on Ukraine's borders. Now, with, I, I think it's, a, it's an obvious truism that uh, any far right movement is going to try to take advantage of whatever political situations are around them. And the Azov movement is no exception. Uh, with the threat of, of the threat of renewed war on Ukraine's borders, the threat of uh, wh wh whether it be, you know, some sort of uh, renewed uh, incursion into Donbass and further into Eastern Ukraine, or some sort of nightmarish full-scale invasion. Azov is trying to position itself as a group that can, as, as, as an entity that can, that has something to offer. So uh, they've begun offering these combat or tactical training sessions for members of the general public. They've had, I believe, at least two so far in Kiev. Uh, one of them, I think at the end of Jan, well, I know at the end of January was covered by international media. I was actually a bit surprised, frankly, they let international media in and even talked to international media, considering uh, how, 
uh, people like me have written about them in the past, but nonetheless, they did. Uh, they're offering these sorts of training sessions, for, whether it's uh, from former members of the regiment, it doesn't appear that any current members of, of the Azov regiment were providing, the, providing any of this training. It all seems to be, you know, other individuals affiliated with the movement in some way or former regiment members, basically providing, you know, training sessions and showing even with, you know, mock wooden weapons, how to, uh, how to, uh, I'm not a military person, so heck, maybe I need to do that. I would need to do this kind of training too, but how basically if in the event of some sort of full scale nightmarish invasion, what exactly, how exactly to hold a rifle, how exactly to fight, what the sorts of tactical things you need to do to defend yourself, defend your city, defend your neighborhood. And they've been doing doing these kinds of sessions in Kiev and a few other cities across Ukraine as well, under this banner translated from Ukrainian of don't panic, prepare yourself. And they've been really effective, I think, in branding uh, what they've been doing. And they've, for at least in the, the Kiev sessions, they've got a few hundred each time to these sessions. So they're really trying to position themselves as not just a force, but positioning themselves as like the force who knows how to defend the country. But there's an irony with the current situation, which I think as we all know, as at least partly stemmed from Russian rhetoric or its position in terms of where Ukraine should be in the world this feeling, the Kremlin feeling that Ukraine is somehow within its sphere of influence and, uh, you know, it should not be part of NATO. It should not, obviously the discussion is more about NATO. It shouldn't be part of NATO. It shouldn't be part of the EU. But I think what's ironic and something to stress is that the, the far right, the Azov movement is not, they're definitely not pro-EU and they are not pro-NATO either. Frankly, many of them, on Ukraine's far right in general, it's not hard to find examples of this. See the West broadly conceived, see the United States, frankly, as just as big an enemy as as Kremlin and as the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin. And I think that's that's something that needs to be stressed when when talking about this movement and in, in in individuals and facets of the movement and the things that they believe in. Like the 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 rhetorical question that that I've posed. Uh, several times is are are these re for your average everyday Ukrainians who are worried about the future of their country is are these individuals is this group is this movement really on your side and I think that's a question that just needs to be asked and discussed over and over again but moving to uh, one of my final points here as I start to wrap up uh, is there, a, is there a role in any future sort of expanded conflict for foreign fighters? The short answer, I don't see much of a potential right now for any involvement of foreign far-right fighters as we saw in 2014. Uh, I think there is so much scrutiny right now on foreigners coming to Ukraine who want to fight that anybody with, like I said, anybody with the slightest far-right leanings or associations with the far-right group is not going to be accepted with open arms or any arms at all. They'll probably just be turned away. But the only sort of circumstance where I could see some role potentially for foreign far-right fighters in Ukraine is if the absolute worst case situation happens, if there is some sort of nightmarish and frankly apocalyptic full-scale invasion of Ukraine, like some of the, some of the worst uh, the worst possibilities that I think we've all read about in, in different media articles or seen on TV, the idea of, you know, fighting, fighting to try to take over cities, to try to take over Kiev's partisan fighting city by city, and just ten scores, tens of thousands of civilians, all that sort of nightmarish condition. I think in that case, there could be, because things would be so anarchic, there could potentially be some role for far-right foreign fighters to, to step, in, step into the mold, um, sort of far-right, uh, um, sort of adventurous, adventurers wanting to 
take part in a hot conflict like this. But even so, I don't think it would be in numbers like we saw in 2014. I don't think the motivations are, are the same. I, I don't think the appeal is the same. And frankly, if the full scale apocalyptic invasion happens, I, I still think it's unlikely, but I don't think it's impossible. And if that sort of thing happens, well, there are a lot, even as somebody who focuses on the far right, obviously, there are, there are much more important issues to worry about if there are tens of thousands of civilians dying in what could be the, the worst conflict since World War II. And I hope, I, I hope that that sort of thing doesn't happen. So I'm just moving to a few final, I guess what I phrase is open questions as as the, as the following weeks and months go on, when people look about or look at or think about the Azov movement, um, my first open question there is sort of a counterfactual that I even pose to myself: is can can Azov even take advantage of whatever happens or whatever doesn't happen? Uh, I think it people like me can sometimes uh, fall fall into the trap of assuming that a far right group can and like can successfully take advantage of, of every situation that it tries to. And that is not always how it works. They may try, but they may also fail. Uh, one example of that with the Azov movement is in the, uh, when in, during the height of the pandemic in, you know, early mid 2020, uh, the Azov movement tried to capitalize on the pandemic by starting up this what they called a volunteer corps they had they would transport medical workers they would they really bought into this uh using using the pandemic as to, to show how they were stepping in when the state wouldn't and they had all these like branded vans with their their uh you know the national core colors but with volunteer corps on it and at the time i thought okay this is a clever thing to, for them to try to take advantage of it but within a few months, by even August 2020, all of that stuff had disappeared. I think they saw what they thought was an opportunity to take advantage of something, and it just they just didn't see any any benefit to them or their their reputation, their standing in society from doing all of this uh, volunteer core stuff. So they 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 put a kibosh on it. They stopped it. So just because a far right group can try to take advantage of something. It doesn't mean they'll be successful. Um, moving on from there, there's, in Ukraine right now, there are, there have been laws passed about what are called a roughly voluntary territorial defense formation. So for example, in a city or town, uh, it's now legal, even though I think the, the nuts and bolts of these sorts of laws still have to be worked out. But basically, uh, uh, citizens can band together and with a uh, with a small arms or hunting rifles or weapons like that, they can legally uh, use them in, in any sort of ter territorial defense formation. And this might be an opportunity, not just for Azov specifically, but the broader far right in Ukraine or anybody to, to take advantage and try to form, well, frankly, form their own sort of small paramilitary outfits. And hopefully this is just a fear that, that goes nowhere, but, uh, no, uh, knowing how the ASA movement and the far right works, if there's an opportunity to sort of legalize oneself, make oneself more legitimate, uh, they will try to jump at that avenue. So we'll, I think it remains to be seen what exactly will happen with these uh, formations. As well, what, what about these, I, I discuss some of these kinds of subgroups more in the book, but what happens to these smaller, more extreme subgroups that are not formally affiliated with the Azov movement, but clearly have some relationship to it and they function under its, its broader umbrella. These sorts of subgroups function with much more relative independence and I stress relative, but what, what are these kinds of subgroups going to do? Are there, are there gonna be small subgroups who are going to take up arms in certain situations where you know, the leadership of Azov or National Corps or other people would, would encourage them not to, would, would there end up being splits in, in the movement because of that? I think some of the smaller, more extreme outfits that may escape a lot of public scrutiny are, are ones to, to keep an eye on, even when it's, even like, I've, as I've done in this presentation, even when it's the, you know, National Corps or, 
or other branded more mainstream seeming outfits that are trying to do all of the legwork it's worth scratching the surface to to see what's behind there and lastly what what about the, the again something else i discussed in the book uh this sort of combat tactical training infrastructure linked to the far right that uh, that exists in ukraine uh, there uh, at, at this point, it doesn't really appear that any of these 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 outfits, these groups that offer combat or tactical training in Ukraine, are doing it for foreigners. But if again, if the situation gets to such a point where things are loosened up, things become more desperate, or frankly, if things become less supervised or supervised or less uh, paid attention to, there could be an opportunity there for foreigners to try to access, even if they're not fighting in an active war, to access a level of paramilitary training that they might not be able to in their home countries. But again, that's not something that's inevitable. Uh, I see that as something of an open question right now. And as you can see, I have, I, I think I've talked long enough about, uh, about some of this. So uh, thanks, uh, CEP and, and Hans for 